G'day, Chris here, and welcome back to ClickSpring. In this video, I use these pieces of sheet metal to make the basic support structure of the mechanism. So what exactly is the structure of the mechanism? Well, if you strip everything away, it comes down to this. A single main plate with a single main bearing located at its centre. The front planetary display is speculated to have been positioned just above the main plate, and the rear display is known to have been located on the other side. It's a three-tiered structure providing support and alignment for the entire mechanism. And you can see that it has features spread across all three levels that are all somewhat related. Now some of these features will be depth from the main central bearing, some from features on the rear dial, and some will be located relative to specific components once their position within the mechanism has been determined. Many of the features need to be formed with two or three of the plates stacked together for reference, like for example the main bearing position. But interestingly, not one of the features is carried through all four plates simultaneously. So it's clear, I need an accurate method to bring the plates into register with each other that gives me the flexibility to combine them as required. The clockmaker way to approach this is to align them in a top-down stack using tapered brass register pins. Each plate is registered with the one below it to lock in the relative orientation. Now it's impossible to know for sure if the original maker used the same technique, but certainly some sort of systematic approach would have been essential. There's a lot happening on that front dial, so dropping in the first set of alignment pins requires a bit of planning. Ideally, they'd be diagonally opposed, some are out on the perimeter. But there are some constraining factors affecting placement that become apparent when you look underneath the top plate. The subplate is shorter than the upper dial plate, reducing the common area to less than what you can see from above. The four pillar locations also occupy some of the space, and of course the centre of the upper plate is largely occupied by the main display rings. So the available space comes down to quite a small, sort of triangular shaped area just inside from each of the corners. The pins can go anywhere inside that space, and to some extent it's preferable that they be a little asymmetric, so that the plates will only match up one way. But the area does need to be clearly identified before I start making holes. So this is the space that I have to work with, and a quick punch marks out where I'll drill the holes in a moment. The next plate down in the stack is the front dial subplate, and it needs to be accurately located adjacent to the top plate before I can drill the holes. I use the known dimension from the edges, as well as the common straight edge to position it. Each of the marked locations was then drilled out in preparation for taper broaching. I use this five-sided clockmaker's brooch to taper brooch each of the holes, using one of the pins to gauge the progress of the taper. The pins were then hammered firmly into place and the opposing holes on the other plate given a light countersink.
Now for the plates to all sit flush when stacked, the pins must sit beneath the surface of each matching plate. So I used a file to reduce the pin length and then rounded off the tops using a shop made chamfer tool. The two plates are now well registered and the pins sit comfortably inside the opposing holes. The excess pin length on the other side was then trimmed off, filed back and blended in with the surrounding metal. The registering process was then continued for the remaining plates in the stack, progressively moving from the top down, registering each plate with the one beneath it. Again, taking care to align the plates carefully before drilling and placing the pins in regions of the mechanism known to be available space. I can now work with the plates aligned in a complete stack like this or in various combinations as required and be confident that the relative positioning of features will be accurate across all four plates. In fact, the next operation is a great example of what I mean. I used a wiggler to pick up the centre bearing position and then drilled out the main bearing hole with just the top three plates registered together. The upper two plates were then removed to permit a light countersinking of the main bearing position and also the marking out of a key arbor position. The subplate was then returned to the stack to pick up the correct position for the pillars and finally the front dial plate was also returned to the stack to drill out the pilot holes for the pillars. Now without using register pins this would have been quite a challenging task to manage. But with them, it's a fast, convenient and accurate process, and one I'll use several times throughout the course of the build. OK, so that takes care of the pilot holes for each of the pillar locations. But of course, I need to be turned into squares to accept the pillar ends. So I took care of that operation next, using this shop-made square brooch. The brooch was inserted into each of the pilot holes and then aligned with the edge of the work using the common reference of the surface plate. I used the tip of a fine cut file to undercut each of the pillar locations to ensure a clean seating for the pillars. Next I opened up the square hole in the main plate that will accept the main bearing. And while it's certainly not essential, the sheet stock could do with a quick tidy up to make it a bit more presentable for the rest of the video series. So I gave it a light grained finish with some 800 grit abrasive paper.
Okay, next up is the main bearing. And like a lot of this mechanism, it's tempting to apply 21st century thinking when visualising the part and assume that it was made as a single integral piece. But a close inspection of the scans reveals something very interesting. As the scan reaches what I'm calling the spacer section of the bearing, the outline of a square hole appears in the centre. That square outline remains through the entire depth of the spacer as the scan progresses through the part. And this is significant, because the presence of a square hole in the spacer leads to an unavoidable conclusion, that the part was in fact fabricated from two separate pieces, a spacer with a square hole and the main bearing body that were then pressed together to form the full bearing profile. Now this fabricated approach may look like a bit of an odd way to construct the part, but it does bring a particular advantage because it permits the basic clearances in the device to be achieved simply by using existing sheet stock of a known dimension. It's what I've done for this part, and there are a few other parts in the mechanism where exactly the same time-saving trick will apply. I also suspect that this approach delivered an even greater dividend with the more complex sub-assemblies. All throughout the device, virtually every sub-assembly incorporates this idea of spaces and wheels either riveted together as a sort of layered sandwich or threaded onto a shouldered arbor or both. Certainly, the wheels and spaces could have been formed from stock selected to achieve a specific clearance, much like this bearing. But it's also easy to imagine the maker taking it a step further by starting with a slightly oversized stock and then reducing the thickness of the wheels and spaces by rubbing them on an abrasive surface. Using this simple method, whole assemblies could then be easily brought to very close tolerances by simply abrading the components and then visually checking the fit until the perfect clearance was achieved. With not much more than a flat abrasive surface and good eyesight, the maker could have achieved exceptional dimension control without any need for absolute measurement. I think it's an intriguing possibility and it's something I'll investigate further throughout the rest of the build. OK, so back to the job at hand, the basic profile of the main bearing body was formed on the lathe and I used the mill to form the squares. The finish from the mill is quite acceptable for this part, but the root of the shoulder still needs a light tidy up to enable a clean seating for the spacer. The spacer hole was then opened up until it was a firm fit on the end of the main bearing body. And you'll have noticed that a small section still needs to be removed from the perimeter of the spacer. It was a clever little dodge, used to keep the head on a nearby rotating hub as large as possible. So with the bearing resting in position, I used a divider to mark out the clearance arc and then used a series of hand files to remove the metal. A quick tidy up of the corners with a slipstone and the two parts of the bearing were tapped together. The bearing assembly was then tapped home into the main plate, 
and then firmly riveted to hold it in place for the long term. Okay, so now that I've got a few bits and pieces to work with, let's have a look at how it all goes together. As helpful as it is to be able to model something like this in CAD, there's nothing quite like seeing the shape and scale of a new project in metal for the very first time. In the next video, I'll begin work on the part that enables the user to drive and control the mechanism, the input crown wheel known as A1. Thanks for watching, I'll see you later. Now if geared mechanisms like this are your thing, and you'd like to help me make more of these videos, then I've got just the thing for you. A modern reproduction of the second oldest geared mechanism from antiquity, the device known as the Byzantine Sundial Calendar, also known as the London Sundial Calendar. I'm giving it the full reproduction treatment, but more from the perspective of how an 18th century clockmaker might have tackled the project. So you'll see all of the techniques and materials that I've started to explore with the Skeleton Clock Project, but developed further to work on this much more condensed scale. Patrons get the same deal as for the first Patron Series project. Exclusive access to the build videos, free plans for the Patron Series projects, and of course the added bonus that one lucky patron will get to keep the finished project at the end of the build. Visit patreon.com forward slash clickspring to find out more. Thanks again for watching. I'll catch you on the next video.